Hello, I am Adam Parker, and this is Robotic Evolution. <laughs> First, a little bit about me, so you know I'm not just some lunatic standing up here waving three arms at you. I'm currently in my second year of electrical engineering at the University of Alberta. Previous to that, I graduated from Nate in electronic engineering, which is slightly different than electrical. Previous to that, I graduated from aircraft maintenance in SAIT. So, robotic evolution. What am I on about when I talk about these things? To me, and it's my title, this would be growing alongside robotic devices, incorporating them not only into our lives, but as part of ourselves, as part of our function. And the primary place where this exists today, and where I've started my research in, is in prosthetics. Prosthetics have come a long way since their inception. That's an American Civil War prosthetic at the top. And the one beneath it is called the Bee Bionic Hand. It's a fairly advanced piece of robotic technology. It has something like 34 servos in it, which amounts to 14 different grip patterns that it can do. But there are certain problems that modern prosthetics still encounter. The primary one that we're moving a lot to try and correct is ones with control. That Bee Bionic Hand, for all that it can do, we have a very limited amount of person left, generally, to control it with. And so that those 32 servos and those 14 grip patterns become open and close and cycle through that list one by one by one. Which means rather than having 14 grips, you usually have three. So even this wonderful device isn't living up to its full potential. Now, some of you may be thinking, what about direct neural interface? And I think some of that's coming up a little later. What about direct neural interface? Thank you. There are certain limitations with direct neural interface as it stands. First, the body is very defensive of your brain and its brain material. So the electrodes tend to corrode very quickly. Second, the electrodes are stiff, and we're putting them into soft, squishy tissue that moves around. And so we get scar tissue building, which is not a good thing in your brain in the first place. And this leads to signal degradation. So they'll work in the short term, but over the long term, they don't yet pan out. But there is research going into this area. So what do we do instead? We we're looking at adding intelligence to the limbs. So the limbs will take on some artificial intelligence and make predictions. They can predict Maybe in the, when you're changing grip patterns, it can predict, learn which grip you're going to want next. Make the prediction and offer it to you first instead of having to switch through a whole list. Now you can have more than three. It can start to do away with the fairly standard robotic one joint at a time motion that comes out of a lot of robotic devices right now by predicting what your next action will be and starting to take over a little bit, take on a little bit of autonomy and carry out the actions for you when it has learned what's going on, what the actions are. As these things become smarter, and as they start taking on autonomy, what becomes important is communication. As they have more that they know, they need to tell us what's going on. They can get confused, the artificial intelligence can, if you throw a lot of things at it. And you might go to catch something, have the hands not open, and look like a tool as the ball bounces off your forehead instead of doing what you want. When if the limb had just said, I don't know what's happening, you're on your own, you might have been able to do something a little different, or at least ducked. Um, traditionally, these sorts of communication come up in the visual domain, which tends to get very cluttered. 
This happens even in our cars. As cars become more advanced, we have sat-nav, we have our traditional speedometer, and our rev counter, and the rear view mirror, and the side view mirrors, and there's cross traffic detectors, and there's blind spot assist. And first and foremost, of course, we're all watching the road through all of this. <laughs> I don't know who thought that through. The visual domain gets filled with things because it's the most obvious domain to communicate through. But not necessarily the best, and not necessarily the most intuitive. Imagine with your um, blind spot assist sensor. Instead of having a light somewhere, your seat presses into your shoulder. Now you can feel where the car is behind you in your blind spot. And as it moves, it would move. And now it's intuitive. It's a more natural, more intuitive way for your car to communicate with you. You start feeling a little more like you're a part of this vehicle, like it's a part of you. And so through additional intelligence and by increasing the communication as we advance way down the road into the future we get to the point where these prosthetic limbs these replacement limbs are as good as the originals but why stop there a robotic device is only limited by what we built it to do so when we have them fulfilling the natural role near perfectly, why stop? Why not have your wrist be able to extend? Add a bit of intelligence, add a bit of communication, this can start to feel like a natural action to you. And then we can reach things on high shelves, or for those of us who are tall, the low shelves. <laughs> Works in both ways, trust me. Or you can have it stronger. You can have tools built into your fingers for what you tend to do in your job or your daily life. You can have all sorts of wondrous robotic and mechanical devices built into you on hand, controlling them as if they were part of your body. Now, the prosthetics are, at the very least, they have more they can do than the natural limbs. But we don't want to go around hacking off healthy limbs. This isn't a good thing. There's a book being recommended to the library folks that goes into why that I definitely suggest. <laughs> So, we can make these devices wearable, exactly as the X-arm here. X-arm just stands for extra arm. We're scientists, we're not that creative. The X-arm we use to do artificial intelligence experiments that we plan to deploy on prosthetic limbs. So it kind of simulates what a prosthetic limb could be. Now, the X-arm has, I'm going to say, three servos because one is broken. And I'm controlling it with a joystick like you see on the screen, like you have on a PlayStation or an Xbox. And so I can move it left and right, or up and down, and both at the same time. But I also have this wrist here. The hand is broken. If I want to use the wrist, I have to change. And now I can operate the wrist. But now I can't move it up and down. I can only move the wrist. So this is a limitation. This is the control channels, exactly like in the prosthetic limb. But what the X-arm does, and what this kind of fifth element inspired sleeve on my arm is, this sleeve is how the X-arm talks to me. When I click, you may be able to notice these lights flash. That's for you to see what's going on. I have little buzzers attached to my arm, like, as demonstrated by the picture there. And when I switch to, well, if I just switch through randomly for a while, I will still know what it is precisely that I'm controlling. This is the broken hand servo, so that's a bad example. I still know what the control is without looking at it, without having to do a little test to, to see what I'm doing. This makes the X-arm control more natural. I can say anecdotally, when I use the X-arm, this makes it feel more like it's a part of me. Sometimes when I give presentations, I don't think this one's going to be long enough. You know, the X-arm's standing like this all day. When you do that with your arm, it gets tired. The X-arm is no different. It gets tired eventually. Rather than just stopping, it tells me what's going on through a sequence of buzzing, and it tells me which servo is tired. And then I know what it's doing. And this communication adds this natural feel, which is, in my mind, the primary requirement for this. So where does all of this lead? Where are we going with this, all of this robotic evolution? At the end of the journey, where I envision this increased intelligence, this communication to the point where everything is natural, everything is fluid, Everything is part of us. We end up 
being Borg by day, and then we can go home and take everything off when we're sick of it. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. It's hard for me to see. You might just want to yell if you have any questions. So does that come in handy bagging groceries? Or? It would if the hand didn't keep breaking. <laughs> One day, hopefully, we'll need a little bit more degrees of freedom. I can move it about yay far, and that's kind of limited. Maybe. <laughs> so when the, when the hand does work, what kind of, what kind of things can it pick up? Um, we've had it pick up a fairly hefty-seeming bottle of glue, though it was kind of angry with us for doing so. And it tells us that, too. So rather than have your muscles tell it what to do or your brain tell it what to do, what happens if you program it to 37 different uh, functions? You've already got each of the 14 servos, all of the processes already pre-programmed, and all you do is verbally tell it to pick up an egg. This is something that could happen, but voice control, if anyone has had an early Mercedes where they tried that, can be a little iffy at best. Also, you run into the problem of you telling it to pick up an egg while I'm trying to do something else, and now all of a sudden it's a little <laughs> frustrating. You definitely want to make sure that it's under your control and not someone else's. Two more when it's back. Isn't that the exact reason Doc Ock went berserk? In spite of it is the exact reason Doc Ock went berserk, but he has a direct neural interface. We have a rule in our lab. We're not allowed having the system talk back into our nervous system for precisely that reason. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Okay. That didn't technically count as a question. So <laughs> one more, yeah. Are you interested in Leo who said control device where they measure multiple impulses? Yes. This arm actually has been controlled in certain demos that way. This box is capable of interpreting those signals, but we don't have a sleeve for it. And it makes the point a little less well about growing with it because I have to be doing this to make the arm move and then this arm is completely out of use instead of just mostly out of use. Adam Parker, everybody.